All right, welcome back. We are getting close to the end of our journey looking at the different measurement tools for DMAIC systems. And we have been exploring ASQ's seven basic quality tools. And today we're going to be talking about data stratification. Sometimes you may hear the term data disaggregation as well. And the idea behind this is that oftentimes when you're doing quality assurance work, you group a whole pile of data together and you've got this big monster spreadsheet and you look at the data and it's just all over the place. Sometimes if you are patient and you have labeled your data properly, you can tease out more information. And if you are going into a new quality program or you're starting a DMAIC um, quality improvement uh, project, you may be in the, in the position of setting your own data labels. And so I want to talk about the importance of thinking through the problem and making sure that your data has enough labels so that you can tease out and disaggregate or um, stratify your data in a useful way. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to discuss the role of ASQ in standardizing methods of measuring quality. ASQ is a fantastic organization. And for people who are involved in quality assurance or quality control, it's a great group to learn more, and they have so many learning resources. I encourage you to discover more. I want you to determine the quality parameters worth measuring for your product or process step and identify when stratification or disaggregation of your data is a relevant data analysis tool. That's a lot of words to say. Just uh, figure out when it's the right time to use it, because it's not always the right time to disaggregate your data, but in many cases it is. We're going to sort our data using Excel. We're going to stratify, uh, use a stratified scatter chart for evaluating data quality. And we'll discuss overlay of stratified data into different chart styles beyond XY scatter plots. It just happens that ASQ's learning tool is in an XY scatter plot. And again, I realize that many of the students who are taking the courses at Niagara College are not mathematicians. And we, um, we encourage students to keep on learning math, except that we often get a lot of mature students who haven't taken math in sometimes years or decades even, and relearning math is a challenge. And so we're gonna take a real common sense approach to this. There are more advanced data disaggregation methods for people who really like statistics. And I encourage you to uh, go and search out those resources. For now, we're gonna keep it, keep it straightforward and outcomes-based. Oh, there's W. Edwards Deming to cheer us on. Lack of knowledge, that is the problem. And so congratulations for continuing on your uh, learning journey today with us. So why stratify data before putting it into a chart? Well, sometimes data gets dumped together. And so I've seen it happen in lots of food manufacturing facilities where they're grouping outputs off of different unit operations and they all get dumped into a single uh, tote at the end of a line. and that's great, except if you are taking your measurements from the tote, rather than going to each of the machines and taking a piece of um, material off of the machine right at the output and measuring there, you could be grouping together potential errors and not being able to see where, an, uh, where the problem is isolated. Lots of times there's uh, not clear data labeling on times of day or who is working on different outputs. Again, we don't want to go and ascribe blame to specific workers. We want to have, a, have an output and uh, outcomes-based approach to fixing problems rather than going and punishing workers. But it's worth going and labeling who's doing what because sometimes people may need some help or they need some support in their job. They may need some retraining or so on. And other times too, it's really great to track what time of day you are taking data because you could be finding um, patterns between different activities. So perhaps you're collecting data before a prevention and maintenance schedule was occurring or a sanitation schedule was occurring, and then after, and you would see very different outcomes depending on what you're measuring. So do make sure that you're giving enough detail in your data collection so that you can figure out exactly what's going on. Also, it also reflects on the importance of keeping logs 
to show what sort of activities are going on in the facility. Sorting data allows you to see those different patterns. And I can't stress this enough, make sure that your data is labeled adequately so that you're not just out there collecting weights and not coding things or um, labeling. It's, it's fantastic. It doesn't take that long. And it's going to make a big, huge difference in the ability to analyze the data that you have. So what do we need to do? We need to go and collect our data. We need to make sure it's labeled. And again, there's not necessarily a specific data collection code that's out there other than perhaps uh, best before dates. That's often um, used as a data coding system, but every facility uses their own data coding system. And if you're a new employee going out to do quality assurance work in an established facility, do make sure to ask, how do you code your data when you're collecting it? so that you know what sort of data points are out there. And if, if you're in a facility, perhaps you're with a startup company, you'll want to make sure that you establish um, some sort of operating procedure to say, here's how we code our data. And we know that this data is then consistently going to be collected in the exact same way. So most, most uh, new students who are graduating are going and joining an established facility, and you'll likely have a template that you're given. But there are blank templates out there. Sometimes it is worthwhile to take data and put it into a blank sp uh, spreadsheet to do some data disaggregation. And we'll, we'll do some of that together in just a couple moments here. Oop, I'm gonna actually go back to this slide after. There's my friend, Tiny. Hi, Tiny. I'm going to just jump straight out and I'm not going to edit this out because at this point, if you've watched enough videos, you know we are friends and friends put up with little glitches like not editing out screen uh, switches. So this is the tool that is provided by ASQ for learning about stratification. And what they have suggested is um, to first try out an XY scatter chart. And if you haven't learned about S XY scatter charts, do make sure to take some time and learn about that um, because there is some intricacy behind it in terms of doing Q-testing or, or quadrant testing. Um, I do have a video and you can look that up on the YouTube channel. What we see here is that they have taken the data from each of the different reactors that are in this factory. As you know, it's all made up data, but what you can see in here, let's see if my pen's going to work today, the data in the pink section is sorting out up there. And the data in the green section is sorting out down here. And there's a black section that's, it's a blue pen here, is sort of clustering. Oh, it's actually a sparkle pen. Is <laughs> sorting out in that band. What ASQ is suggesting, rather than doing some sort of complex regression analysis, yes, learn about regression. It's absolutely uh, useful and fantastic, but ASQ, with their tools, because they understand that most people who are, are being introduced to this are entry-level workers, they just want to really focus on the visualization. And what we can see already is that there's uh, there is stratification, that the data is not all clustering in those three different reactors into the same cluster. That means that it's worthwhile doing this stratification. If you are seeing that the data is all, pardon me, but glomming all into the same space, you may not have the resolution to be able to see that you've got those sorts of differences. Now, in this case, they would have coded that they collected XY data on each of these different reactors. You need to make sure that you have put in some sort of coding so that you can separate your data out. Now, I have an example in a second spreadsheet, and it's actually from an assignment that my students did in second year. Oh, those of you who are in third year would remember Tiny and his tiny jars. And those of you who are in second year and maybe uh, watching this video, this is the sort of data sorting that I was hoping 
that people would do. And I've, I found it quite hilarious when people said, there's too much data, it's too difficult to sort. And I'm like, that's not a lot of data. Back when I worked in industry, you'd collect this much data in like two hours. Now imagine that you had to do a week's worth of data. That's not a lot of data. And I, I shrunk the screen out for a reason. I can go in and I'm going to highlight the two columns. So if you note here, I'm, I, I, I should have read the titles for you in the beginning. I've got tiny sauce and tiny jars. And what we've got is a code here. Oh, wait a second. We can likely parse out what this code is already. It is 10.08.20b. 10.08.20b is likely a date. And we've got 10.06.20b. And actually, I will confirm. 10.08 and 10.06.20b is October 6th and October 8th, 2020. A and B. Hmm, I wonder what that is. Perhaps it is two different lines or two different filling heads or two different um, sublots within the day. Doesn't really matter. The thing is, good job, Tiny. He actually labeled it so that we could have some sort of stratification. The students in the second year complained and said, this is too much data. How are we supposed to analyze it? That's what Excel is for. And that's why we make our students at Niagara College take a course in Excel. And now I know who paid attention and who didn't. I can highlight these two columns. And I'm going to scroll out just to make sure that I've got to the bottom here. We're going to highlight these two columns. You'll note the A and B and the, the product made on the 6th and product made on the 8th is all jam together. And those of you who remember the problem set, our friend Tiny had a recall on um, underweight jars and he went out to the warehouse and grabbed a couple cases of jars and the jars were all mixed together in different boxes. And while it's better to keep lots in single boxes, I can understand why as a small tiny business he may have mixed two different lots in two different boxes. I can highlight those two columns and I can quickly go in and do a sort. So I'm going to do sort highest to lowest, or actually can do sort table. Let's do sort table actually. Sort by, and first off, I want to sort by column E, tiny sauce and tiny jars. Wait, so I'm sorting by column E and I'm going to sort by val uh, values A to Z. And let's see, and Drum roll, please. If I scroll back in now, I have all my data for A. And it is all grouped together. And so I can pull this apart and make my graphs quite easily now and have this disaggregated data so that I can see the different patterns between my product made on the, on the 6th versus product made on the 8th. I can do that sort of uh, comparison, or I can do comparison between product made on line A versus product made on line B. And so if I'm doing any sort of hypothesis testing, I can do these sorts of comparisons across my sorted data. Sorting, so first, the first take home message, I, I can't stress this enough, make sure that you label your data in some meaningful way so that as you're collecting it into a spreadsheet, as you're collecting it into the spreadsheet, you can quickly sort it into different categories. And now I could make a different graph for each of these, each of these uh, colored categories and be able to see the patterns. Or I can also just collect some average and standard deviation data on each of these subgroups and be able to see some patterns. So data sorting or data disaggregation is as good as your labels, to be quite frank. So let's just jump back here. Now, just be uh, thinking back to XY plots, just because you see correlation doesn't mean causation. We are going to do our very last tool. It's my very favorite tool, and it's the most common sense of the tools, which is uh, called Ishikawa analysis or uh, fishbone, because it links back into what's called root cause. We're going to take all of the wonderful uh, measurements that we have made over the past uh, couple weeks, and we're going to dig in and say, 
what is the real problem and how can we now go and pay attention to that real problem and get it fixed so that our product retains the quality that we want and our systems function as optimally as possible. So yes, data disaggregation is fantastic. And yes, we are going to see some really good patterns, but now we're going to dig in and figure out what that cause is. So leave you with our W. Edwards Deming principle. We are going to be using all of this rich information to make sure that we are digging deeper. Data analysis is all about problem solving and we're not going to burn toast anymore. We're going to prevent toast from burning and we're going to have quality product going out all the time. So I think that's it. PDSA, PDSA, PDSA. I feel like making a song, but I won't. I'll leave you with that. And Take care. Send me your questions. I love hearing from you and we'll talk to you soon.